to uh, Yugoslavia and back to the Triumph team. So uh, it will bring back memories, I think. How does it feel? Well, I've only, only driven it from the car park to here, so uh, I haven't really um, had a chance to see who's boss with it yet, but uh, give us three days, we'll be all right. Bjorn, you're an active competitor. What are you doing in a historic rally? Uh, they say it's so funny, so why not try it? And uh, at my age, it should be the sport I should do, isn't it? <laughs> this is your next career, is it? You never know, and it's fantastic to sit in old Porsche again. A lumbering Ford Zephyr was on parade among the sleek Porsches, which to many looked like brand new models. Don't you think it'll blow them off? <laughs> it must be quite a handful. My, uh, it's quite big. <laughs> and the tree's yeah. going to be closed. I like it though, I like it. I, it's just a, a nice car. Is this the end of Tiffany Dell, the racing driver? No, no, no. We still like prefer going round and round in circles. These trees are a bit too close to the trackside for my liking. Classic rallying is the fastest growing branch of motorsport at the moment started out a few years ago as a bit of fun is now becoming quite serious stuff. Although the cars must be pre-1966, the crews can be of any vintage, and modern day enthusiasts can mix and mingle with their heroes, many sitting alongside them if they have a suitable car for the occasion. Well, we're fast for the minutes coming up. Three, two, one, go. Here we are, Tiffany Dell from BBC Top Gear. Give them a cheer. We might never see him again if we're lucky. Last year's winner, Jerry Larson from Sweden, headed the convoy on the quick, smooth stages in North Yorkshire. For Roger Clark, though, they were anything but smooth. TR4's low suspension making it clatter along like a toboggan. Bumps coming. And it was far removed from the tarmac of the Nürburgring for our man Tiff and co-driver Ian Bond. They weren't on the original notes, were they? Fast right. Fast right. The big Healy was always a handful in its heyday and still is. Junction, open hairpin left. Hairpin left. And this is what is known in the trade as ditch hooking. 1984 World Rally Champion Stig Blomqvist, chauffeuring the car's owner, Dr. Beatty Crawford from America, was a little more circumspect. Roger Clark was still ploughing on, and to add to his troubles, his horn was dropping off. And junction. Fast left. These logs. Bother these logs. And... John Haugland from Norway made his name driving Skodas in World Championship rallies. Tiff was getting the hang of mini-motoring, but doing a lot of shouting into the bargain. Where's my left foot? I missed my left foot braking! Tony Dron in the big Ford was happily playing the role of mobile chicane to the Porsches, which seemed to be everywhere you looked and starting to dominate the event. From the RAF, Harrison Krause piloting their Lotus Cortina. But this was the last competitive sighting of Norman Grimshaw and John Clegg, who ended up perched on top of a rock. In the 60s, Porsches dominated European rallying. But then again, so did the Mini Cooper, although this particular one would have to do better than this to win this rally. 90 left. Left, 90 oh. left. What are you doing? I was looking at those arrows. The TR4s were never really at home in British forests, but in classic rallies, who cares? Everyone's here to have fun, albeit serious fun. The boys from the RAF appear to be on a secret night mission. Everyone else had their headlights on. Next, come on! Left! Easy left! Next! I've got to have the next one sooner! Rallying is meant to be a team effort. Junction, hairpin right! 
junction. But the poor old navigator right. seems to take all the flack from these glamorous driving types. Of course, they're always perfect. For Roger Clark's TR4, the Yorkshire forests were proving a bit too much. He retired at the end of the night with a whole sum. Back in the forests, the pressure was on, with assorted Porsches blowing everyone off. 90 right. Including our glamorous racing driver. Notice the navigator is the epitome of politeness and says nothing. But of course, there's always an excuse. So it's just the handbrake button I've got. I pulled the handbrake up, which has been working well, got the button stuck in, and then we slewed sideways. Correct. Okay? At the end of the first day, there was time for quick service at Beverly before cars and crews were locked away for the night back in Hull and a time to reflect on the day's performance. Well, the car's going very well. The driver's crap, but the car's going very well. <laughs> what do you think of these stages? Uh, they're very interesting, uh, but made the wrong choice of tyres. We, we've a bit, bit, too, bit too light on the rubber, but very, very nice, very nice. Um, not at all boring. Norman, we hear you've had problems. Yeah, we fell off in a ditch on the, on the last stage. We were in there for about an hour, so we're OTL at the moment. Well, you mean you're out of the event? I'm not, we're not sure, are we? No, I think we're allowed to play. I think tomorrow. we're allowed to play tomorrow, which we will do, of course. So you didn't do much damage then? No, no, it just it was just wedged on the sump shield on the chassis. We just couldn't get it out. And what do you put that down to? Over exuberance? Uh, complete stupidity on, on behalf of the driver. <laughs> Dawn saw a few unexpected hazards that had to be removed, but after a short night's sleep, the cars were reseeded in their positions in the rally, and guess which ones were dominating the leaderboard? Scandinavians were everywhere in rallying, and it was the same here. Bo Warmenius in his Lotus Cortina was highest non Porsche ahead of Tiffany Dell's Mini. Michael Prising from Germany was content just to trundle along in the most ungainly car in the event, a 1959 Opel Olympia. From further afield, two Japanese gentlemen whose near kamikaze antics had them travelling on the very edge. is more used to motorbike racing. A narrow 4.4 mile circuit makes overtaking difficult, but there wasn't too much of that as the car set off at 15 second intervals. Nevertheless, everyone was enjoying this first smooth stage and even Roger Clark came out to play in his low line TR4. stage twice, attempting two laps each time. The Volvo P544 was always notoriously tail happy, and this one bore the odd battle scars to prove it. But rally drivers aren't meant to play around on tarmac too long, so it was back to the woods and the most fabulous rally noise of all, a big Healy in full cry. And another distinctive sound, its smaller stablemate, the MGB. Last year's winner Larson was languishing in third place in the gaggle of 911s, which was headed by Oke Anderson in number seven. Well, we're getting towards the end of the second day and the end of the Yorkshire stages and nobody can do anything about all these Porsches. In fact, some people are saying it's rather boring. 
you going to do anything about all these Porsches, Tiff? No, no, we've forgotten the Porsches, though. It's just those Cortinas. We're getting a bit serious about trying to catch the Cortinas and being the first non-Porsche. <laughs> Well, we've spent the day working our little whatnots off and getting absolutely nowhere against these por porkies. <laughs> Are you in the, you're in this sort of separate race, really? This is a non-Porsche division, is it? Oh, there's some very nice rallying going on outside of all the Porsches. We're having a great time. And uh, unfortunately, another Swede is knocking spots off us in the Lotus Cortina. Are you going to slow down tomorrow, then, so we can catch you up? I You're going to give us a down. chance. I just go faster and faster and faster. Well, if you keep going faster, hopefully you will crash soon. No, then. no. Faster and safer, all the time. <laughs> when I crash, it's always in the beginning of a, of a rally. What happened? Oh, uh, last day, last stage, uh, Horace driving. I'm very enjoy driving, very fast. But <laughs> here peace, goes out, rolling. Rolling? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, how, how many times did you go over? But uh, one nose and uh, roof sliding. <laughs> oh, sliding on the roof. Uh, the place where you have the crash is very famous, where Hanno Mikola, he once crashed in the same place. <laughs> really? <laughs> same yes. place. So, you're in good company. <laughs> so, an eventful and hilarious day for our Japanese friends, who next morning set forth to the land of the rising sun, Scunthorpe. If you thought the forests were a bit tough on the old cars, look at this little lot. This is the huge British steelworks at Scunthorpe. It covers 1,700 acres, produces 30% of the country's steel, and there are 39 miles of private tracks. And boy, are they rough. No prizes for guessing the make of leading cars on the Sunday morning, day three. Again, the first non-911, Bo Warmenius in his Lotus, going faster and faster. And also going better and better was the intrepid duo in the Mini. Tiff now had Bo in his sights. He'd already got ahead of the other Lotus Cortina of ex-European racing champion John Hanley and Tony Moy. Next! What's next? Easy right! Right! Although the Top Gear Mini had been going well, as it neared the end of the stage, something sounded not quite right. It would have to be all hands on deck to keep it in the rally. Cadwell Park in Lincolnshire provided a pursuit sprint, but it was touch and go if Tiff would make it. Not, not in gear. With the engine in bits and time running out, things didn't look too good. What was at first thought to be a broken clutch turned out to be more serious, a broken crankshaft. For Oke Anderson and Lars Torrell, things couldn't have gone better. They led from the start and won the Charringtons in fine style. Following them onto the ramp, you've guessed it, another six of the dreaded Porsches.